Good afternoon, how are we all? Welcome to, welcome to the afternoon se session. Um, we're going to talk about influencer marketing. Um, so I'm going to get the guys from VAMP uh, up in a wee second. So VAMP are the best influencer marketing uh, platform and company. Don't take my word for it. They work for companies like Airbnb, MasterCard, New Balance. Um, they f were founded in Australia. Uh, in 2015 and they've now grown worldwide with offices in New York, Hong Kong and here in London. Um, they are going to do a Q&A afterwards so please go on to slido.com um, and if you search for the hashtag SG Europe to get your questions in uh, and without further ado uh, please give a really warm startup ground welcome to Aaron and Jonathan. Beautiful. Hey guys, how's it going? Everyone had a good day, hopefully. Um, so just to kick off, uh, my name is Aaron. I'm the co-founder of VAMP. Uh, Jude gave me a nice introduction there. So VAMP is an influencer and content marketing platform. Uh, we're in offices, uh, we have offices in nine locations around the world. We're a Facebook and Instagram marketing partner. Uh, and I'm going to just do quick introductions to Jonah as well. Yep. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm a videographer and photographer and I've worked in a couple of campaigns for the VAMP platform. Cool. Um, so guys, we're here today to talk about how to implement influencer marketing in your business, but what we wanted to do was to do it from a creator's perspective. So how to work with them, some of the tools and tricks that they, uh, that they use to create amazing content. Um, so we're going to dive into that in a moment. But first I wanted to just kind of ask you guys a couple of questions. So I'm just going to make sure this clicker actually works. Intro's done. Uh, so. Who actually uses influencer marketing in their business already today? Okay, a few of you. All right, good. Uh, who is considering using influencer marketing in their business? Okay, quite a few. All right, this is the tough question. Who tried it and never went back to it? Okay, one. Well, hopefully we can convince you otherwise. Um, but we wanted to try and share some information that kind of caters to everyone. So no matter, no, depending on where you are in the, in the cycle of trying it or using it um, or looking to try it, then hopefully we can cover some good insights today. Uh, so how to implement influencer marketing in your business. The first question that I wanted to kick off, Jonah, and I think the, it's always the, the most yeah. important one is, do you like to be called an influencer or a content creator? Um, if I had to choose between the two, it would probably be content creator or photographer or uh, videographer because I think I use my Instagram feed as more of a portfolio for my prospective clients. Um, my business isn't actually modeled off Instagram. It's actually a, uh, yeah, I've actually offer a service to people. So if Instagram fails, I've still got a skill, hopefully, that uh, will be in demand. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so that one's out the way. Uh, so to, to start with, and this is something that we see in VAMP quite a lot, you know, there's um, the initial kind of hook that kind of gets you involved in or collaborating with a brand. I know at VAMP we do a lot of work to help educate the brands on the briefing process. So what are some of the things that you look for when a brand initially reaches out? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think in order for me to create authentic content that's true to me, true to my interests, the brand has to align. So uh, you know, the brand's core values and their interests has to align with mine. Uh, I sometimes get, uh, you know, collaborative offers from clothing companies or gadget companies, but they don't necessarily uh, align with my travel photography, videography uh, aesthetic, I guess. Yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah, it has to That's align it. and be benefitly, uh, mutually beneficial for the, both the creator and the brand. Yeah. Yeah. And um, th this is another big interesting topic, which is around the content and the content that you guys generate and then how brands utilize that. Um, are you seeing brands becoming more savvy about the assets and getting you to create content that maybe they could potentially repurpose into other channels? Yeah, totally. Like uh, brands are getting an influx of content creators and the quality is like getting better and better and better. You've seen the average nine to five employee pick up the camera uh, just on the weekend, maybe shooting their partner or significant other, like how I get, got started. Um, they go from photography, then they move into stop motion, then videography, and then full-blown commercials. Um, so yeah, I mean, as the content creators upskill, so do the um, brands. They know what good quality looks like and they know 
uh, yeah, how it's made as well, just from YouTube. You can YouTube anything these days and you can probably like learn how to create something. Yeah, because there's even that thing where we're seeing, uh, you know, even at VAMP where you're seeing the content get transferred into maybe more traditional channels like out of home, um, you know, but there's that kind of upfront bit where the brand almost knows what they want to do with it, with the asset once you guys create it. So getting you to shoot it in a certain resolution so that they can repurpose it for those channels. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, once we shoot the content, it's up to the brand to then use that for whatever channel they see fit. Uh, so, like in terms of what VAMP actually does and repurposing, um, I think you had have some examples. Yeah, so this is actually something that we thought was quite interesting, and this is kind of the next stage. I don't know if the videos are actually working, so we got told, but trust me, they look really good. Yeah. Um, imagine they're moving. But this is kind of this, this, this next layer. So um, you can see that these are things that Jonah's created uh, for New Balance and Samsung. But then what the uh, brands are doing, and we do this at, at VAMP, is what we say making it ad ready. So actually putting into the ad ratios, um, so if you wanted to serve it into Instagram stories, for instance, making it 9 by 16, making the image a moving image. Um, so that additional layer that you guys now, the brand are kind of requesting that instead of getting all these assets that the influencers produce, which is amazing, yeah. but then making them into the ratios that they can then launch them. Exactly, yeah. So I think like a bit of clarification because there's no uh, videos playing at the moment, but on the left-hand side you have the original influencer content that could be shot from uh, anyone basically. But then on the right, it's supposed to be uh, videos playing. And uh, you can see there's like call to action, shop now, and it's actually a full-blown ad. Um, so yeah, it's just repurposing it. Yep. And I'm going to take you through a case study in a moment, um, in a little bit, but to actually just show how the brands are uh, uh, getting the creators to produce that asset, post in their feed, and then utilize the engagement um, of the influencer to then gauge how well that content's performing so that they can reuse that content into the ad platform, Facebook ad platform. Um, but then, you know, even seeing brands serve it into uh, Google Programmatic for the display network and things like that as well. Um, cool. Um, well, there's always that really, uh, and I was just listening to Dom Price talk from Atlassian before about tools for remote working. And I guess creators are like a remote workforce. So what are some of the apps and stuff that you use to edit up images? Because I guess it's relevant for brands um, as well. Yeah, uh, I think some of the apps, they're pretty well known. They're like the Adobe suite. So Lightroom and Photoshop for your photos and then Premiere and After Effects for like your videos and graphics. But I think there's like a big uh, stigma around needing to have a desktop, needing to have a laptop, the latest camera to create content and like create good content. Um, all you need is a mobile phone, to be honest. All you need is a smartphone. There's influencers and content creators with like hundreds of Ks of followers, um, and they're making, they're making bank, and uh, <laughs> they're just using their phone. They're literally yeah. using uh, like one app to edit and uh, post photos, yeah. Yeah. So. And then, so that's some of the foundational creative tools, and what's the process that you guys, what, what puts the process you go through to get creative? Because I imagine that is not like something that strikes you between nine and five, Monday to Friday. Yeah, exactly right. Um, we were talking about this before, but uh, my day, or well, my night, starts around like 10 p.m. Sometimes, to my, my girlfriend's dismay, I finish at like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., but it's just when my mind's most creative, uh, it's it's kind of like crunch time. Like I, sometimes I have to deliver to Sydney, and living in London here, it's I think 9 a.m. is 12 a.m. here. So I know that by 9 a.m. I have to deliver these videos to um, the Sydney team, and basically it's like uh, I guess how every uni degree was was earned. It's just the night before, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cramming for the exam. Yeah, exactly um, right. I think that's one thing that also at VAMP we try to do is give the creators these long kind of tail, you know, week, two weeks to produce content because we, you know, realize that it's not a, you know, you get a brief all of a sudden and you know what you want to produce for that, for that brand. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think a, a big mistake brands make is actually setting either unrealistic deadlines or deliverables. So, you know, X amount of photos or videos before uh, like three, you only have like three days to, to do it. So... Yeah, I think that's a, one of the big mistakes that, uh, that brands make. Um, and then what are, what are some of the, the tips and tricks today that you could give people in, in the audience about working with influencers specifically, what, what to look for, or um, yes, some foundational things they can do? Yeah, um, I think quality over quantity. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily have the biggest following, but I think I put in the work into my, I put in the quality into my work, 
and that shows to uh, big brands, and that's what, how I've been able to land some big brands. Um, yeah, so quality over quantity is one. I also think uh, not putting too much of a focus on number of followers, because it's not a very uh, stable metric, really. It's more about engagement and how that influencer engages with their community. I mean, they could have 500 followers, and that might seem like a lot to, to people, might not seem like much to some, um, but that could be 500 engaged uh, followers of that audience, as opposed to someone who's got 100K followers and maybe only 10% or like less actually engage with their content and actually, uh, yeah, are true followers of them. Yeah. yeah. So making sure that, uh, yeah, the, the content they produce is, or is it value to the content they produce and that creative process that they, get, that they go through to, to get assets into the feed. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. And then uh, this is always a big one, especially for, I guess, smaller companies and startup companies is, you know, being able to curate the perfect feed for Instagram. It's not an easy thing to do. So when it comes to just brands' feeds, what are some of the things that they can do to make sure their aesthetic is on point and, or just some tips and tricks? Yeah, um, I think one, one basic one is using apps that actually plan out your Instagram feed. So there's apps that are like, uh, Unum's a big one that I use. Uh, and also Plannerly, and they can uh, schedule and post. I don't know if they can post for you just yet, but I know that you can schedule it out. So you can, for example, uh, plan out your marketing for the week. Let's say Sunday, you know that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm going to post. And uh, yeah, so you, you only have to dedicate like 30 minutes to Instagram throughout, throughout the week. Yeah, and it doesn't take up all your time. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's one tip. Cool. Um, you kind of touched on it before, but just to go into a bit more specific, what, what are some of the mistakes you think brands make with working with creators? So is it sometimes the briefing process? Like what, what do you sort of find, maybe just specifically to your case that you find can be a stumbling block? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I guess the briefing process is one. So undervaluing the influencer as well. So if they haven't necessarily got a large following, they might be producing really, really good quality content. Um, and so if you're underpaying them uh, differently to like an influencer who's got more of a following, like there's a bit of a uh, yeah, mismanaging of, of yeah. that. But also, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think undervaluing them and basically, yeah, mismanaging them. Yeah. Yep. Now, Johnny, you've obviously worked with some really good brands. So we wanted to kind of just showcase um, some of the stuff that you've done, um, but oh, I guess your favorite brand collaborations, right? Because, you know, even at that, th like that kind of power middle or micro influencer level, you know, you guys are still working with amazing, you know, incredible tier one companies. So take us through some of these ones. Again, there were some videos here, but they're, they're not rolling, but um, they, they do look good. But yeah, take us through these, your kind of, I guess your favorite. Um, yeah, well, these are the three on the left uh, for Adobe. Uh, I'm one of their ambassadors uh, here in London and in Sydney, and I use all their creative suite. Um, so those are just from my travels. Um, and then we've got Converse there, which is an ad-ready format. So I didn't actually shoot the content myself, but I edited a video. I'm not too sure if you can play it, but uh, yeah, I edited a video for them, and it became one of the ads that they were running. And also for Max Factor, which is totally not in my field. Um, my actual my partner is a beauty and uh, travel photographer and influencer, and so it's cool that even though I'm not in that space, I can shoot her stuff um, and like help her out with some of that stuff as well. Yeah, that's cool. So you can still find you can get creative on something that even though it's not necessarily suited for your feed, but you could still shoot it creatively and and have input. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really cool to just be watching. You said like on inspiration before. Um, getting inspiration right from social media itself. I mean, like Picasso says like, uh, a good artist copies and a great artist steals. Like you shouldn't obviously be stealing another person's work, but I mean, you draw inspiration from that. And so it's good to always keep on trends. Um, and yeah, I think we'll, we'll go through some of the other uh, yeah, influences but, that are quite yeah, big at the moment. Because you kind of mentioned the creative process and I imagine that you use Inf uh, Instagram to, to, you know, kind of get into the mood on creating good content, but we kind of wanted to touch on, I guess, some of your favorite influences and ones that you, I guess, get the most in or draw the most inspiration from. Yeah. Uh, the first one up is Sam Calder, which I'm sure some of you may know. 
Uh, he's a big travel influencer, but I think he was one of the pioneering ones first, I think 2015, 20, 2014 even. Uh, and he's just gone from strength to strength in terms of video and um, uh, photo, travel, uh, travel videos and photo. And uh, yeah, he's like sponsored by a couple of big brands now at the moment. Uh, we've got Damas, who's a friend from Sydney. And he's, uh, he's a really good one to follow if you want to know what's on trend at the moment. So for example, uh, Game of Thrones, the season finale was a couple weeks back. Leading up to it, the week before, he was doing Game of Thrones inspired photos and edits. And those are some of his most popular photos because, you know, the whole buzz around it, seeing what's on trend. So he plays the game really, really good. Like, his Instagram's pretty much a game. It's just likes are just points and whatever. Like, it's, it's not really that important. Yeah. And then uh, the third one is my partner, The Love Assembly. Um, she's been blogging since I think about 2012, 2013. Um, but she's a really good example to see uh, what, like, how to create a business online, but also offline. So she's starting to, to move away from the online and try to build something more real and brick and mortar so that you know, if Instagram or if social media completely fails, you've got a backup. Mm. Um, so yeah, you've got like product or you've got uh, a book. She's also an author. So yeah, it's not just all based off social media. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And then what about some of the other um, apps that are kind of on the rise that you say, or at least social platforms? You know, there's been a lot of work uh, talk about kind of TikTok and um, I think, you know, Snapchat for a while was sort of struggling, but it's kind of still there. So yeah. is there any other kind of social platforms that you're... Well, I think TikTok. TikTok's a really good one to, to have a look at if you're uh, thinking of getting into influencer marketing as well. Not my generation, but I think the generation that's probably about 9 to about maybe 18, 19, they're, st they're really big on TikTok at the moment. And they're using Instagram totally different to how I've been using it. I'm only like 29. Um, so I think I was talking to one of uh, your friends, Ben, and how his kids are using Instagram. They basically use it as a messaging service. So they actually uh, have maybe 10 of their friends have a private account and they just post you know, silly photos of themselves, selfies up on that feed. So they're using it in a completely different way uh, to, to how I'm using it. And so if you know, brands can tap into that, it's a really powerful tool. Well, I can see that there's a few uh, questions coming up, so we'll uh, leave a bit of time for Q&A. I did just want to quickly show you a very quick case study. So I wanted to, to we, we talked about kind of what we call ad-ready content. Um, so this actually showcases Pottery Barn running an influencer campaign, then reusing the assets into what we call ad-ready formats, and then putting them into the Facebook ad platform. So uh, they spent $7,000, we generated $84,000 in conversions. So adding the Facebook pixel to the content and then also to the e-com site so we can marry them up, um, but a 1,200% uplift. Um, so a really good way for you guys if you're running the influencer stuff um, and you know a big part of that is the content they generate to reuse and repurpose that content effectively. All right, guys, I think we've covered a few topics there. Hopefully we've given you some good insights. There's a few questions here, so I, I think I've got like three minutes. So... Um, <laughs> Should we pick one, Jonah? Yeah. Uh, Do you want to go, what's your view on using micro-influencers? How would I go about finding relevant influencers? How can a brand consider the use of influencers standing out in a crowd space like travel? Okay. Uh, I think with this one, how can a brand that's considering the use of influencers stand out in a crowded space like travel? Like, every space is saturated now at the moment. Every space is. It's just, it's just fact. Food, fashion, whatever. I think with the influencers being authentic to themselves um, and just you basically aligning with that influencer's core values. You can also see if they're consistently posting uh, and if they're building an engaged audience. So like I said before, that real indicator is an engaged audience. Um, if they're not replying to people, if they're not, uh, yeah, if they're not promoting that brand, if, you know, you can, you can see through it on Instagram if someone's just holding up like, uh, you know, some toothpaste and trying to promote it but it's if they actually use it and they're promoting it uh, in a positive light as well and their, their audience is engaging with it. So I think that's how you would choose amongst the, the influencers. Yeah. Cool, so there's a question there about what's your view on using micro-influencers. Um, for us at VAMP, our strategy is to use anything from what we call power middle down to micro-influencers. So it's about 5,000 followers and probably caps out about half a million. Um, we use those people mainly because they do produce amazing content, they've got really high engagement, um, they've got much more connection to their audience. 
So uh, that's, that's our view on using micro-influencers and you get to, we've got one minute I've been told, but yeah, you get to generate much more assets through them and, and, and assets that can be repurposed by the brand. Yeah. Um, we can, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, how do you feel about finding releases to an extent? How often should my business post on Instagram? So um, this is one thing that I was actually going to talk about. Uh, you can be posting once a week, once every two weeks, I guess, is, is a bit... Uh, a bit of a stretch, but I think once a week at least is, is good. If you don't have content to post, never underestimate the power of quotes. So if you're a business that's trying to promote entrepreneurial, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit or giving top tips, it's, it's really simple to just pretty much open one of those apps that can actually add text to a blank screen and just quote your favorite, I don't know, Gary Vee quote or Tim Ferriss quote and post it there and that becomes one post for, for your week, you know, and it's just to keep relevant. It's like watching Netflix. Once you finish your series, you're on to the next one. So if your, your brand isn't posting, you're just on to the next, uh, yeah, on to the next channel. Cool, guys. We're out of time, but thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far and appreciate your time. Thank you.